very good morning to everyone uh, my name is shruti i am part of marketing team of elsevier india i would like to welcome you to today's session uh, by dr vinay kumar and dr manoj singh where you will get to interact with the authors to, through question and answers before we start today's session i would like to lay out some of the housekeeping rules which all of us have to abide by to maintain the decorum of this session all of you are on mute and are going to remain so so if you have any question that is to be asked please post that exclusively in the q and a tab at the bottom of your screen please refrain from using the chat because anything that has been posted in chat section will not be acknowledged or answered to this session is already in recording and a recorded version will be circulated back to all the participants today over an email in uh, a few days we have kept an a uh, very interesting q and a section towards the end of this session and uh, both the authors will be answering as many questions as possible as much as the time permits if some of your questions go unanswered in today's session uh, we will get back to you through an email with the answers to those questions and uh, with that we would like to uh, i would like to hand this session over to my colleague priyanka who will be moderating today's uh, uh, talk to author session along with me over to you priyanka thank you shruti uh, i once again would like to welcome all the participant in today's talk to authors session robins and cotton that pathologic basis of disease this book and our expert authors are very well known among the medical fraternity and as i welcome them on this platform today it is indeed my pleasure to read a few lines of introduction for them so i will introduce both our speakers to you now our first speaker today is dr vinay kumar Dr Vinay Kumar is the Alice Hogg and Arthur Baird Distinguished Service Professor of Pathology at the University of Chicago. He did his MBBS from Amritsar and MD Pathology from Ames New Delhi. After completing his MD in 1972 he was offered a faculty position in pathology at Boston University School of Medicine by Dr Stanley Robbins. He moved to the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School at Dallas in 1982 and was promoted to full professor with tenure in 1983. In March of 2000 he moved to University of Chicago as chairman of Department of Pathology a position which he held until December 2016. Dr Kumar has made seminal contributions in two areas of medicine basic research and education and he is also very deeply interested in education of medical and graduate students having served as the pathology course director at Bo at both Boston University and UT Southwestern at Dallas along with the late doctors Stanley Robbins and Dr Ramji S Cotton Dr Kumar has co-authored Robbins Pathologic Basis of Disease and Basic Pathology for the past 40 years currently he is senior editor and author of both these texts which are now in their 10th edition together they are the most widely used and influential pathology texts in the world and have also been translated into 13 foreign languages in 2020 he facilitated the publication of south asia edition of robins and cotton pathologic basis of disease this is the first time that any regional edition of robins has been published dr kumar has numerous awards for teaching and research including cancer research scholar award from the american cancer society an honorary fellowship of the royal college of pathologists in london he was elected as a fellow of the american association for advancement of sciences in 2004 for pioneering studies on the discovery of nk cells he travels extensively to india and across the world to promote medical education reforms and to emphasize the importance of basic sciences in medicine welcome dr vinay welcome to the today's uh, to today's session thank you Our next author and speaker of today's session is Dr. Manoj Singh. Dr. Singh is currently associated as professor of pathology with All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He successfully established the first dermatopathology laboratory and service in India at the Ames. He has various dermatopathology writings to his credit and has delivered numerous talks, lectures, and orations all across India. Also he has published over 130 research papers pertaining to the dermatopathology and surgical pathology. He has been acknowledged with numerous awards for his exemplary contribution in this field and he was awarded the KC Kandahari Oration of the Year 2000 by Ames for pioneering work in derma dermatopathology. 
He has also been the president of the Indian Association of Pathologists and Microbiologists in 2014. Dr. Singh is associated with various professional and voluntary associations for spreading awareness about health issues among students. Welcome, Dr. Manoj. Uh, so now, uh, participants, it's time to hear directly from these eminent personalities. So I hand it over to you, Dr. Vinay. Thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Elsevier India and people present today here and people who have been working behind the scenes uh, in making uh, the South Asia, Asia edition, as mentioned earlier, the first time an edition which is regional, which has regional content added to it that has been made. And I'm actually very proud of it because it is my country, India, where this is, this is happening. So uh, thank you all of Severe India for making this possible. And uh, I also want to thank every one of you who is attending it because uh, you may not realize that authors exist only because students exist. So, so if there is nobody there to listen, then what do we do? Futile. So I always consider uh, education as a partnership between students and teachers. There has to be a dynamic interchange between the two all the time and respect for each other. That's the only way education succeeds. And uh, with that in mind, I, I thank you, as I said, and I'm very respectful to all of you who have come to listen today. And I hope you will find uh, what we are going to say is interesting. So I've been asked to sort of talk about the new edition of the main book, the Robinson Cochrane Pathologic Based Diseases. So before I, before I tell you what has changed, I want to emphasize to you what has not changed. That may be an odd way of starting a presentation, but it's important. What has not changed is this. When Dr. Robbins published the very first edition of his book, he, the book was very different from any previous pathology textbooks. Most pathology textbooks at that time were descriptive. They were just descriptions of morphology, microscopy, or electron microscopy, or this and that. Robbins said that was not enough. He said pathology concern is concerns with mechanism of disease. Pathology is a bridge between basic sciences on one side and clinical science on the other side. So it's actually the foundation of the practice of medicine. That is why what you see in our books right now is every topic starts with etiology, which is the cause, pathogenesis, which is the mechanism of the disease, morphology, which is the manifestations of the tissue and organ, and clinical features. Now, these things are taken for granted these days, but when the book was first written, this was not the way pathology was taught or written. So that aspect of the philosophic aspect of, uh, of Robin's pathology, which is pathology is the scientific foundation of the practice of medicine. And when I say medicine, I mean medicine, everything, every specialty, internal medicine, surgery, you know, dermatology, uh, you know, uh, pediatrics, uh, GI, cardiology, everyone, everyone, has to understand pathology. So pathology plays an extremely important role in education of students, and I think it's uh, uh, appropriate that we discuss you know, what the books contain. So, so what has changed? I'll talk to you about the new information that's been added, and, and, and you know, people often don't understand, realize the, that when we add new information, then we also have to take out something. Because Robin's book of pathology, the one that you have, was 1,400 pages when it started 60 years ago. It's still 1,400 pages now. How, can, how is it possible? Unless when we add material, we don't take out something. So we have to be very careful when we do a revision as to add information, which we must, the new, the new information, but also do it in a way that it doesn't keep on increasing the book, make the book fatter and fatter and fatter to the point where it has become indigestible, so to say. So, so, so that... I won't talk to you about what we removed. I mean, there are things which are out of date, for example, theories and hypotheses and things which are no longer valid for which were previously there was a page of it. Uh, those things have been removed, but without affecting the flow and the content of the book. So now I'll sort of spend some time with you talking to you about some notable changes in the 10th edition. Next slide, please. Okay. So, so starting with chapter one, chapter one for now, includes gene editing technology. And gene editing technology is really something which came up in the last few years. 
is one of the most powerful genomic tools that has been built. And this, this figure that I won't talk to you in any detail about, this figure is a new figure. It wasn't there in the, in the previous edition. And it goes on to show in this section, how does gene editing work? Basically, gene editing can remove a disease-causing gene and or add a desirable gene. And this can all be done without having to go through the embryo and blastocyst system and so on and so forth. So, so it's a very powerful tool. And I think, for example, uh, if somebody is bored with thalassemia, uh, that thalassemia gene can be deleted and or sickle cell gene can be deleted or you have muscular dystrophy, muscular gene can be deleted. All these things are in the process of being developed and they're being done mostly in experimental animals so that they are, we know they, they are safe because sometimes when you change the genome, there are unexpected results. So we would never go to humans uh, right away. It will take several years, but, but the two groups which developed this, uh, this, this process independently, I'm, I'm absolutely certain we'll get Nobel Prize in medicine the next three or four years. So that's one of the most exciting things we have added. Next slide, please. Now, I'll sort of go from the beginning chapters. The, the, the second chapter in the book is uh, entitled Cell Injury, Cell Death, and Adaptations. Now, cell injury and cell death is very fundamental to human disease. Every disease eventually affects the cell in one way or another. Okay? And therefore, we have always studied a lot and taught a lot about different pathways of cell death. And until recently, there are two pathways recognized. One called necrosis, other called apoptosis. In a simple way, necrosis was a pathway in which energy, energy production goes down. So the cell fragments and ruptures and enzymes come out. So if it's a heart, the heart enzymes come out and they're used for diagnosis of ischemic heart disease. Apoptosis, on the hand, is a very regulated process. It's not like putting a hammer on top of a cell, but it's a very genetically controlled process. So until, until a few years ago, necrosis and apoptosis were considered two distinct and main pathways of cell death. In the last few years, we have learned that actually cell death has other pathways, and there's a path which is called necroptosis, which is illustrated in this, uh, in this slide. And I won't go into the details of it, except that it's a hybrid between necrosis and apoptosis. That's why it's called necroptosis. Now, why is it important to know this new pathway? Because we are finding that several diseases, several brain disease disorders, for example, uh, and cells are damaged by necroptosis. So if we understand the pathway of necroptosis, we will develop a treatment protocols which target specific, uh, uh, specific uh, pathways and proteins which are involved in, in breaking down of this, uh, the cell here. The next slide. Next slide. So the new plasia chapter always has a lot of new stuff because progress in the understanding of, uh, of uh, cancer has increased tremendously over the last several years and is still continuing to increase. Now this sort of figure that you see, which looks like a wheel, uh, has several uh, you know, things on it, which, which are which they're called the hallmarks of cancer. Each, cancers, each cancer has each one of these hallmarks, which are features of, of the cancer, such as being able to grow without growth factor, being able to resist cell death, being able to, uh, being able to uh, not, not, not respond to normal growth, growth inhibiting signals, being able to spread in the body. With all these hallmarks, in the last few years, two important the hallmarks have been added. And the one which is on the right on the top there is uh, avoiding immune destruction. I think this has played, this has become very much in center stage of treatment of cancer in the last few years. And in fact, uh, there are now remarkable advances made in the treatment of lung cancer and several other cancers where immunotherapy has been able to actually cure a very large number of patients who would otherwise have died. So the next slide, Next slide is a new figure, which was not there in the previous time. It, ex it, it explains how cancer cells escape being killed by the immune system. What cancer cells are there, they're very clever. They use the same methods that normal cells use to prevent from being attacked on own cells. So to prevent autoimmunity, we have controls. 
Some of those controls are illustrated in the lower part of this figure. I just as an example. Uh, there's a molecule called PD1, and there's a molecule which is a ligand of it called PD1 ligand. Other side is the T cell receptor, which normally recognizes and could kill cancer cells. But because cancer cells are clever enough to have the PD1 ligand, for which PD1 is expressed on the lymphocyte, that's an off signal. The cell doesn't get killed. So what are, we, what are we doing these days? What we are doing these days is this, we have put antibodies to PD-1 and antibody to PD-1 like that. And they are, in, they, are, they are infused into cancer patients. So that break, that escape pathway, escape pathway is neutralized and the cell can kill tumor. Remarkable, remarkable effects have been found. This is the single, the, there's already been a Nobel Prize has been granted for this two years ago by Jim Allison. This has, this has led to remarkable advance in treatment of cancer and will continue to do so for more and more cancers later on. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that we are very careful about and we are well known for about, about is that our books are very up to date. I mean, I give you an example of how updated this is. You know that COVID-19 really began to spread and understood sometime in March, okay? February, March, and so on. Here we are sitting in the middle of June Within, within three months, we, we, we managed to put a description of uh, COVID-19 in the book. How did we do it? Because we, we told the publishers literally at the last minute before the book was going to print, this is very important, we have to, we have to allow it. And it's very uh, nice of Elsevier to allow us to add these things uh, at the last minute. So most textbooks are out of date when, by the time they're published. What they have is usually about two, three years old. Our textbook is tried very hard to keep absolutely up to date, as you can see with this uh, write up on, on, it's not just two lines, it's actually a very whole column which describes this disease. Next slide, please. So I just want to go to now other chapters, later chapters. So one of them is disease of infancy and childhood. And you know, in this we discuss various diseases. One of the ones the one I'm going to reuse today to uh, explain to you the novel, what has been new is that it's well known to many, those especially those of you who are already in your senior years or those of you who are PGs or your faculty members, the cystic fibrosis is a very important disease of childhood. And it's been known for quite some time that the cystic fibrosis patients have a defect in a chloride channel, which normally allows chloride to come in and out of the cell. Until a few years ago, it was thought that cystic fibrosis is one disease. We now know cystic fibrosis is six diseases. How do we know that? The next slide will show that. Next slide, please. You know, I don't want you to get confused and even when you become students and you have to read the book, I don't want you to try to memorize this. And this is not for memory. This is for understanding disease mechanisms, okay? And you understand disease mechanism, you will understand what the new treatments are. So this slide shows in a very detailed form that on the top you see one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six different types of mutations which cause cystic fibrosis. They all affect the function of the same, same chloride channel. In some cases, like in group one, there's no, no, no protein made. Okay? Second one, protein which is made is non-functional. Third one, protein which is made, but which channel, channel function is poor. Now, because we know now that cystic fibrosis is molecularly six different diseases, different treatments are being developed for different types of mutations in cystic fibrosis. Okay? And right now, in, uh, FDA has approved clinical trials of three different molecules. It's interesting, they are called, uh, they are called correctors, amplifiers, and potentiators. And these three act at different aspects of the of the, of the uh, synthesis and transport of the of the protein, and so together they have now been found successful in patients with cystic fibrosis. And work is going on to find uh, molecules and drugs which will help the other other patients with other mutations as well. So this slide is only to illustrate to you that that. CF is not one disease, it is six diseases. And each of those six diseases has a different form of treatment. And the treatment is not at hypothetical stage, it is already in clinical trials. 
Is that something? Yeah, so, so it, it, this is something which is very interesting. Uh, there are several people in the last five, ten years who noticed that uh, as humans age, they develop small clones of hematopoietic cells, okay, which are scattered throughout their body. And they seem to have one or two mutations which are in the pathway towards becoming cancer. So they are sort of precancerous mutations. So it was expected that these patients who have these, uh, these called uh, um, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, uh, everywhere the CHIP, will likely get more leukemia because they already have, they already have, uh, uh, they already have cells which have gone part of the way to, to, to becoming cancer. What came as a surprise in the last four or five years, which is why we put this in the book, is this, that when people were followed over a long period of time, most people died of atherosclerosis, not cancer. Nobody thought atherosclerosis and cancer are related diseases. But now we are beginning to understand why having these abnormal clones makes atherosclerosis, the disease of the arteries, worse. And so this has become a very important tool in now following people in terms of what development of atherosclerosis and the pathway that is used, which we still don't know. But, but we have been brought in this discussion. Again, our goal is not just to make you memorize things, but for you to understand things. This is mechanism of disease, which is what, what we are trying, we always trying to teach uh, through our books. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that we do, uh, every time when we sit down to uh, sort of revise, uh, revise the book, uh, we sort of take a look at all the, at the literature, the three of us sit down, and of course we have read all the chapters before, and we, we, we say that, okay, it looks like these three chapters really need fresh work. They need a fresh pair of eyes. They need people who are not, who have not been professors for 100 years. They need people who are younger, who have a different way of looking at disease. And so we ch we change the contributors. So in this edition, for example, we change the contributors for the liver chapter, for the male genital system chapter, infectious disease chapter, and a couple of other chapters. So when we get new authors, new contributors, we tell them, start from scratch, okay? Give it the look that you want to. Don't go by what was there before. So that actually creates really new ways of teaching. And, and we do that sort of over the, you know, two or three editions we have, we have turned around all of them. And the people who we ask not to write are not bad. They are our friends actually. And they understand that, you know, regeneration, regrowth, rejuvenation requires fresh people coming with fresh eyes. So this is not an obvious thing people notice, but it actually is very important. Next slide. Now, one of the things that we are very proud of is that, that we, we try very hard to make schematics so that conceptually difficult things can be illustrated. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and pathology is after all a visual science. And we are all sort of to some extent visual learners. Okay? Most of us learn better from an, from an image than from a written text. So I'll give you some examples of new schematics that are there in this book, uh, which, which I, uh, and I'll tell you why they're important. So you probably know, those of you who are, who are in advanced stages of your MBBS or who are MDs, you know that hepatitis C which until four or five years ago was a lethal disease. It's one of those, it's a disease which can be cured actually. And how did the cure come about? The cure came about by looking how drugs for HIV were developed. You know, HIV right now is not a fatal disease. People live with HIV for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But they also, but that is because they have now developed four or five different drugs which attack different parts of the life cycle of the virus. So using the same principle, drugs were developed for treatment of hepatitis C. So this figure actually shows the life cycle of the, of the virus coming into the cell and then going through various steps in, in, in replication. And in the, in the, those red things in boxes are inhibitors or targets which are attacked by drugs. So there are a combination of three drugs which affect different parts of the life cycle of the hepatitis C virus. And 
the easiest way to illustrate is through through this rather than just text. The text, of course, is there, but there's a visual way of seeing this. Next slide, please. And uh, again, some of you will know that uh, heparin, which is used as anticoagulant, if about 5% of the people who, who use heparin, they get very severe thrombocytopenia. In fact, they, they bleed and they also have thrombosis, very sort of con contrasting manifestations. And this has been not understood well until a few years ago. And this diagram illustrates now what we know about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia as to how heparin molecules interact with platelets and how they make antibodies against them. Antibodies then go on to uh, cause aggregation of platelets, which, which uh, causes platelet activation and thrombosis or death of platelets uh, through removal by spleen. So again, complex disease, somewhat simplified by a new schematic. Next slide, please. And it's not always, you know, cancers and viruses that uh, that uh, that we try to teach by by new new illustrations and so on and so forth. Even something like iron absorption, which has been known for a very very long time, you know, we've known about iron absorption in general for the last almost 50 years. But we keep on learning more and more about how how iron absorption is regulated. In this, this is a new illustration in the, in, in the book. And this now puts one of the last links that was missing in understanding iron absorption. And that is production of a hormone by erythroid cells called erythroferone. Okay? Erythroferone, which is a product of red cell precursors, acts on the liver, in turn, which controls the secretion of a molecule, hepcidin. Hepcidin controls iron absorption. So this is a mechanism by which the erythroid cells by producing the epiphoron can influence ion absorption. And this is a new concept. And again, there's a new figure for that. Next slide, please. You know, some, some of the figures we make new are not because they're conceptually new. Wound healing is known for a long time. But we said, wouldn't it be easier for students if we made this a three-dimensional figure rather than just a plain two-dimensional figure? So here it is. Okay? You know, it, it, there are, there are, there's no there's no advancement in the, in the understanding of wound healing, but it's an easier way to learn. We are constantly trying, constantly trying. Dr. Robbins used to say, remember one thing, it is not important what is written, what's important is what is learned. So we can't be satisfied because we wrote this thing, it's enough. We have to also be sure that what we wrote is actually helping the learning. And these are the kinds of things we do to improve learning. There's an example for doing something to improve primary to learning. Nothing novel, nothing cutting edge, but nevertheless important. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I think I will hand over at this point to my colleague, uh, Dr. Manoj Singh, whom I have known for, I don't know how long, <laughs> very, very long. Uh, uh, he's an AIMS uh, person, I'm also an AIMS person. We meet often and uh, and we've done some, some things together which has not to do with the book also. Uh, so so when, uh, when the decision was made to have a South Asia edition and to have South, South Asia edition had, have content for South Asia, uh, I couldn't think of anybody better than Dr. Manoj Singh who understands, is a very great, great, good teacher and someone I could rely upon. You know, you, there are a lot of people who say, koi karega ha okay? but they actually don't deliver. So he, he does it and he delivers in high quality. And he'll tell you now what's in store for you in the South Asia region. Manoj. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, uh, could I have the next slide, please, Kritika? Uh, when uh, uh, we started talking about uh, putting in some uh, additional content from this part of the world, uh, we uh, thought of various possibilities and uh, of course adding it in the main content was one but uh, that would have been a very complicated uh, uh, methodology because one would have to then you know talk with the original authors and uh, get them to put it into the chapter and so on and so forth so we came up with a with a with a new idea which uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, all the all the readers of this book will like. Uh, uh, in this, what we did was, uh, as the the main book was getting finalized, we 
went through the chapters, a group here in uh, India, we went through the chapters and uh, our mandate was very clearly, you see what is there in uh, pathology or disease pathology in this part of the world, which is uh, which, which can be expanded on. There are, uh, as a result, some things came out which were not mentioned at all. There are some diseases which are exclusive to this part of the world and a lot of diseases which are, you know, very prominent here and uh, uh, present to a very much lesser extent in other parts of the world. So uh, we, uh, uh, I'd like to mention one, uh, one, one, one particular thing here. The contribution which we have made is in volume two, uh, which will come after uh, chapter 29. Uh, for this uh, uh, job, uh, I talked around with many people and uh, I am happy to say that I came up with this group of, uh, of uh, uh, contributors, an absolutely brilliant group. I would say we have uh, 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 managed to focus on very hard working because what they had to do was uh, you know first of all screen the original chapters and then find things which could be added then write it up and then it had to go through uh, the editorial board here and then uh, 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 dr vinay kumar and the original editorial board and so on and so forth so i am extremely happy that we managed to find this group of uh, um, young, mostly, I'm also part of that, uh, young and dedicated people who have created what uh, we call at present the Southeast Asian content, South Asian content. Now this is uh, in this book, next slide please, formatted as a, as a uh, edition so that the, the um, uh, pagination and so on and so forth are not upset. We have not contributed to all the chapters. We have made significant contributions in some of the chapters. And uh, wherever this is uh, uh, a, a change has been made or an addition has been made, that is mentioned in the main chapter also. Next, please. Oh, well. Uh, now, uh, one of the uh, uh, issues which we looked at also was how much an undergraduate should know compared with what that person is going to learn in later life. Now, these pictures are not from the book. They are from my own collection. Now, these are uh, photos which any pathologist in India or adjoining countries will not have any problem with at all. This is uh, uh, a tuberculoid leprosy, the coat sleeve like uh, granulomatous uh, uh, involvement uh, around the appendages. The next two slides are uh, uh, foam cells, lepromatous leprosy. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, the special stairs are actually not relevant. Uh, uh, on, the, on the main slide, a pathologist should be able to make the diagnosis. But uh, the question we asked ourselves was, how much does an undergraduate know about leprosy? Leprosy is a very common disease in our part of the world. Uh, you know, WHO says leprosy has been variable statements, eradicated, removed, descend, whatever. It's here. We are seeing as much leprosy in our hospital as we saw 40 years ago or more. So uh, the question is that these diseases, the infectious diseases are uh, diseases which should be known to the undergraduate. Now, this type of, uh, you know, um, uh, microscopic recognition and so on may be uh, relevant only if that person specializes. But this also is of importance for a person who is a pathologist, a dermatologist, a general medicine person, a pediatrician. So, in fact, the base knowledge has to be built in in the beginning. Next, please. Uh, so, um, as I was saying, um, um, the wherever there is a South Asian content, 
on the first page of the relevant chapter it's mentioned see additional south asia content on page so and so and uh, the index for both these is common and uh, as i had mentioned this is in two volumes so the index will be there in both the volumes south asian content is only in the uh, at the end of volume 2 so uh, uh, next slide please so our uh, uh, focus in the beginning was on infectious diseases tuberculosis as you know is a very very common disease in our part of the world and there are parts of the world where tuberculosis is not known or known now because of the large um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, influx and efflux of uh, people all over the world but primary diseases many of these are and they don't occur so what we see of tuberculosis of leprosy is something which uh, which uh, may be an eye opener to a medicine practitioner i would say uh, in other parts of the world so we felt that it is important that perhaps the the uh, at the undergraduate level itself a person should become aware of the fact that there are diseases which have a differential uh, incidence in parts of the world and if you are staying in one part of the world you should know something about what happens in other parts of the world because uh, not just people uh, and residents even uh, medical staff are going from one country to the other next please manoj may i interrupt for a second sir may may, may i add something here please do so so uh, if you go to the previous slide can you uh, kritya can you go back to this slide yeah so so uh, i want you to understand one thing it isn't that tuberculosis is not discussed in the main book in fact there's a lot of big description of tuberculosis but intestinal tuberculosis which has disappeared from the western world because of use of pasteurization is still there still there in india so the morphology that we have added to 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 in the south asia edition is a morphology morphology mainly in fact it, it says in the beginning because it is sort of tuberculosis is um, more common here a more detailed description is given so so the description of intestinal tuberculosis which was two lines in the, in the main book is now a whole paragraph for the whole thing on the right side is leprosy and dr manoj showed you those beautiful slides of leprosy so yes there is some description of leprosy in the main textbook also but there's no discussion of leprosy vaccine for example which is important for people to know in india so there is there is a whole paragraph on leprosy vaccine so i want you to understand uh, this is how we are sort of uh, this is how we approach this thing okay the tuberculosis yes dealt in the main book but these aspects of tuberculosis are not dealt in the main book at the same time we also looked we asked that look at mci competency so the mci competency includes knowledge understanding of the pathogenesis of intestinal tuberculosis and we don't have it there so we were guided by various factors one of which was mci competency so uh, carry on now please uh next slide please yeah thank you uh uh and we then uh, once we started looking at these uh, you know the, the the different organ systems and and the the chapters in um, uh, in the main book we started discovering that there were also other conditions where uh, you know the incidence in this part of the world is very significant and these uh, of course all diseases are seen everywhere but general awareness may or may not be there now uh, uh, the other uh, major issue of course is the age incidence there are cancers which have a markedly different uh, uh, maximum age of uh, uh, incidence age of maximum incidence in various parts of the world etiopathogenesis of cancers is different in india um, a very very large proportion of cancers are tobacco related mouth throat 
uh, lung. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, mouth cancer is so common in our part of the world and uh, uh, the consequent treatments of that uh, because of tobacco chewing. Uh, we came up with other similar issues which we have uh, included here because we felt that it would be significant and important for an undergraduate studying pathology anywhere in the world to know that these do occur. Uh, as part of the South Asian uh, content, uh, there is uh, one particular thing which I would like to highlight and make a special mention of. Uh, uh, you know, when I, you would remember, you mentioned that we um, uh, have not at all, even though we have something on hematology, but uh, uh, in the main main book, but we have not uh, mentioned anything about transfusion medicine. Next slide, please. So I asked uh, the people in our blood bank, and they have done an absolutely astounding job of writing this small little chapter on transfusion medicine. This is our uh, blood transfusion officer, Dr. Poonam, and uh, three assistant professors who are now uh, working in the blood bank. And this, I think, is uh, a small little chapter which will be of great benefit, not only to undergraduates, but also to almost all postgraduates in any branch of uh, medicine. And um, uh, it's, it's concise, it has all the relevant details, and uh, of course, uh, it would not be enough uh, to teach a person you know, uh, adequately to run a blood bank. But background knowledge, yes, I think this has got absolutely adequate and very well presented uh, stuff. And uh, I think uh, these four people have done a brilliant job. Uh, Manoj, Manoj, if I may add, uh, first of all, these people have done a brilliant job completely, okay? And they have, they have, they have condensed in five, six pages everything that's really important about transfusion medicine. In fact, it is so good that I think in the next edition of the International Edition of Robbins, we will try to include some of this in the form, in, in some form. Okay? We will uh, either add it to the blood chapter or add it somewhere else. Because I think we are not teaching enough of transfusion medicine in the U.S. and in India, it is being taught very well. So you know there are you know these these exchanges occur in both directions. Um, next, please, Fitika. Over to you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Manoj and Dr. Vinay. It was uh, really very insightful, and as we rightly say, it is best to know about the text, uh, a book, from and its making from the makers themselves. So now we are moving on to the Q and A session. Uh, Dr. Vinay and Dr. Manoj, we have received a lot of questions from our audience today. So few of them I will read to you right now, and then you can answer them. So should I read the questions to you now? I think you know, Kritya. Uh, uh, I think that. Uh... Some people had submitted questions to you in advance. Yes. And you, you have provided us a list of those. Yes. So I, so, I think that I, I, I think that we might first go and answer those questions, and then later on, depending on available time, you know, uh, answer other questions uh, from the audience. The one thing that I want to tell the audience is this: that we are not going to answer questions today on content. In other words, if you ask us a detailed question on on the genetic structure of HIV virus or uh, uh, or uh, some specific disease somewhere here or there. Uh, we, we are not we are not experts in everything that's in the book. And so this is not a teaching exercise. This is more of an exercise for you to ask questions about the book, its content, how to use it, and so on. So we may not be able to answer all the audience questions because I can, I can see some of them are very specific uh, content oriented. And it would be improper for us without uh, not being experts in every, I mean, I, 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 I did the entire book, but I'm not an expert on every chapter. Okay? So uh, I would not pretend to answer questions in areas which are not within my first-hand knowledge. Okay? Uh, so uh, if, if I may read the questions submitted uh, by the participants in advance, 
Uh, I, I was read those and uh, uh, many were submitted and I picked a certain number of those which I thought were your general interest and I'll answer them. Shall I start? Uh, yes, Dr. Vinay. So I will first read on the questions which we have already received. Uh, yes. And then later on, we can take on the live Q&A. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Vinay, many of the participants had asked the same question about what are the latest updates in the new edition of Robbins. I know you have covered it uh, during your talk, but anything else you would want to add to it? Yes, yes. You know, obviously, you know, I could present everything in the talk. Uh, but I can highlight certain additional things that we did not have in the talk. For example, inflammatory bowel disease which is now, it's called lifestyle disease, which is now becoming more and more common in, in India. Ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease and so on and so forth. Okay? So we have a lot of updated information on the pathogenesis and also to some extent manifestation of these diseases. We have the latest classification of lymphomas. Okay? Uh, there's a lot more new knowledge on dementias, the Alzheimer's dementia and the frontotemporal lobe dementia, FTLD, which affects younger people. So we have a lot more information on that. We have new information on brain tumors, particularly glabular stomach multiformity, uh, which is uniformly lethal. lethal. And the classification of myopathies has changed. Okay, uh, The thing which was called polymyositis, actually that entity almost doesn't exist anymore. So we have changed those things. In infectious diseases, of course, we make a lot of changes because new infections come up, new information comes up. Uh, another area where we made big changes is diabetes. And diabetes, of course, is endemic in India, as, as you know, many of you know. Uh, it's a disease which is all over the world. And uh, a lot still remains to be learned about diabetes, in part because we still completely don't understand insulin function and signaling. So we have a very nice new section and new figures, actually, on insulin signaling, which help us sort of understand uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Similarly, cardiomyopathies are becoming more and more common. And there are increasing number of genetic causes for those. So we updated those. So, you know, in, in almost every chapter, we have updated something. Okay? These are just examples of those things which are in addition to what I showed you earlier. Uh, okay, so our next question, Dr. Vinay and Dr. Manoj. Uh, this is a question asked by Dikki Datta from Gohati Medical College. He says, please share some latest updates on liquid biopsy. So, so it's an interesting question because I don't know how many of you know what liquid biopsy means. Uh, it sort of seems odd, a biopsy which is liquid. Okay? When I first heard, heard of it, I said, how can there be a liquid biopsy? Okay, biopsy is a biopsy. <laughs> liquid biopsy is the name given to, uh, obviously the questioner knows the answer, the, what it is, but others may not. So let me give a little idea. Liquid biopsy is a method of, uh, of uh, studying the DNA of tumors without doing actually a biopsy of the tumor. So how does one do this? We now know for the last several years that uh, DNA of tumor cells circulates in the blood. And cell-free DNA can be extracted from the blood of cancer patients. And the latest updates on this are by using automated techniques and high, high, high throughput techniques one can actually study the genome of the cancer cells without actually taking a piece of it. Why is it important? Because I think this helps in deciding on targeted therapy. So many targeted therapies are being developed based on what we have learned by using liquid biopsies. A very, very important, very, very important advance in that is that we can actually follow the cancer patient. Start, let's say you start treatment with drug A or drug B. <clears throat> You can six months later do another liquid biopsy and find out whether those mutations are still present or they're not there, or if the new mutations have come. So if the new mutations have come, you give a new set of drugs. So <clears throat> liquid biopsy actually allows the studying of the genome, cancer cell genome, over a longitudinal period of time, over months and years and years, and uh, allows better monitoring of disease and also better treatment of disease. <clears throat> Uh, next question, Dr. Vinay. Um, excuse me. Vinay, uh, uh, I would like to add a morphological uh, counterpart of what you said also. Um, liquid biopsy is also uh, an important part and gaining more and more importance as, uh, as time goes by 
in uh, cytology diagnosis. Cytology, as you know, is the study of individual cells as opposed to tissue diagnosis. And uh, uh, liquid biopsy cytology or LBC is a different way of preparing the uh, collected sample, whether it's an inflammation yeah. yeah. from a tumor or it's uh, actually a liquid specimen, a urine or a pleural fluid. It's a different way of, of preparing uh, this in which the morphology A is, you know, the earlier in earlier times, cytology smears used to be you make a smear, uh, dry it or fix it and stain it. So in uh, in this uh, liquid biopsy preparation, the smear is more uh, homogeneous. The preservation of the cells is said to be better. Uh, clumping, which may happen in many liquids where there is a high protein, uh, that also is avoided. So the morphology is felt to be uh, by many expert cytologists to be different. And many centers are now switching over to LBC as a primary diagnostic modality. Right. I, I think there's a term called CTC, circulating tumor cells. So which is what you are describing. And I think uh, uh, it, is, it is another, it's, you are absolutely correct. It's another form of liquid biopsy. So you can actually get whole cells, CTCs, okay? You can phenotype them by flow, for example. Okay. Yeah. They are fresh. Okay. Absolutely. So there are artifacts of uh, death and dying cells and so on and so forth. So, so there are many advantages of doing it this way. And of course, it is uh, not invasive. You know, you just draw blood, just like you draw blood for doing blood urea or hemoglobin. So it is, it is uh, getting more and more uh, importance and usage as you correctly point out. Next one, please. Um, yeah. Uh, so the next question, Dr. Vinay and Dr. Manoj, uh, this is received from Avantika from SN Medical College, Agra. She wants to know, is reading Robbins going to help us in getting good scores in USMLE step one, two? Yeah, I, I laugh because I, this is a question. I, the reason I kept this question was because so many people asked this question. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not, not surprised this question comes up. <clears throat> so, uh, Answer is yes, okay. Uh, but but you know I'm also mindful of the fact that uh, that you know it's very hard for a student to memorize everything in this big book, and, and this book was never written with the idea of preparing students for an exam. This book was written for preparing students to understand these mechanisms, okay, and be uh, scientifically trained in practice of medicine. But then. Uh, again, it, uh, ans answering your work, and, and Kritika, the next question, which is a part uh, yield, is related to this question, says, Robin is such a high yield book that every single word of it is important. So how do we retain all the stuff? Okay. And what topics are more important than others, which have to be learned and which can be skipped? Okay. These three questions are all sort of related in a way. Okay. And my answer to these is, is uh, actually... Uh, uh, I mean, I give you a serious answer to this. This is something that we as authors are always concerned about because we, we want the book to be useful for understanding and practice of medicine, but not a burden at the same time. So we have done certain things to make these questions uh, uh, easy, easier. Okay? Uh, before I go to that, for example, if you really want to know how to prepare for USMLE Step 1, then, then the book that you should read, which is a companion of this called Robin's Review of Pathology, which has got 1,500 um, MCQs. In fact, I'm in the process of actually revising that for the next edition to be linked with this edition. Uh, so that's, if for strict preparation, that's it, I would go there. It's not for understanding, it's for preparation only. But what we have done, realizing the difficulty students face in doing this edition is something which is it's a subtle, but I'll mention to you. So when you read the chapters, what you will find is this, at the beginning of any section, there is a sentence or two sentences in boldface. Okay, now to us, those are the, those are the essence of what is to, to follow. It tells you what the take-home message is by reading those. So if you read that, then you read the read the rest of the book, rest the rest of the chapter, and then you come to this box is called key concepts. So if you now match the key concepts with the first the, the boldface statement that tells you what is really important and what is really probably going to be tested. So in that sense, yes, it can help you. 
provided you know how to use the book. And and we are trying to make it easier for you to use the book by having this bold face. Previously, we used to bold face everything and anything. And students had no idea whether when we bold face a phrase, what it meant, bold face a sentence, what it meant, bold face uh, in, in italics, what meant something else. We have completely removed all of that. There's only bold face, and bold face is only important concepts at the beginning of a section, then summarized at the end by a section called key concepts. So that can help you to prepare for your exams and also help you deciding what's really important that must be remembered and what's less important to be understood but does not have to be remembered. So as an example, the, the, I showed you that six different genetic forms of cystic fibrosis, absolutely not, you should not remember those at all. You, you will see in the chapter, in the first sentence of the chapter, doesn't talk about six mutations of cystic fibrosis. Okay? And the key concept, it says there are many genetic forms with different treatments, but doesn't ask you to memorize any one of them. So we're trying to do these little tricks uh, in presentation that can help the student uh, address the issues that are asked. Uh, may I add, um, Vinay? Mm -hmm, sure. uh, there are actually three questions which uh, are looking at different aspects of the same issue which uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar mentioned about uh, USMLE step one and um, high yield book, every word is so important. And then the third one, uh, which are the topics which are more important than others? Uh, uh, I would like to rephrase these three questions into one question. Uh, how important uh, do you think uh, comprehensive understanding of disease processes is? Because let me tell you, uh, 30 years ago, um, uh, when uh, MCQs uh, were kind of coming in, uh, it was a very golden period 40 years ago because I was, uh, you know, a student at that time. And, um, you know, they we used to have those USMLE books, which were multiple choice questions. And when we got multiple choice questions here, uh, we knew that many of the questions would come from there. So if you would go through those MCQ books, then many of the questions you knew the answer to. Now, that was a different sort of way of studying. Today, uh, reason assertion, uh, discussion are regaining importance. So if you have understood the basis of uh, a particular uh, change, pathological change or a pathological process, then you would be able to, uh, once you have understood that, you would be able to talk about it or you would be able to answer questions on that. So learning by rote learning is now actually getting less and less important. And if you have understood the, the, the disease processes in a chapter, then uh, there is no reason why you should not be able to do well, whether it's in USMLE or any other exam. That's absolutely correct, Manoj. And I just want to add to for the students that uh, I used to write USMLE step one questions. Uh, I was four, for four years, I was an examiner. And, and that was probably in the mid 80s or so. Okay? The questions we wrote at that time are different from the questions we are writing now. The questions that are being written now test comprehension, test analytic thinking, test ability to integrate things. You know, for example, the question may be in the form of a table, which are results of uh, some lab tests. And the answer may depend upon the, the ability to uh, understand those tests, synthesize them, integrate them, and then answer. So, so everybody in the world is moving away from memory, okay? uh, but students sometimes mistakenly feel that USMLE is a memory test. Okay? USMLE is actually less and less a memory test, more and more a comprehension test, as Dr. Maro just mentioned. Okay, uh, do, so Dr. Vinay, Dr. Manoj, uh, I will read out just one more question that we have received before, uh, beforehand, before we move to the live Q&A. So our next question is from Shubro Bhattacharya, Medical College, Kolkata. Uh, he says, are there histological studies of the affected organs and tissues under COVID-19? So I'll answer this question because this is something, let me first say, uh, even though we have a big chunk on, uh, on COVID-19, uh, etiology, pathogen, well, whatever we know about pathogenesis and morphology and so on and so forth. 
we, we, we decided very carefully not to put any figures. And I'll tell you why. Okay. We have described that most cases when the autopsy is done, the lung shows diffuse alveolar damage. And it's that diffuse alveolar damage is described in great detail in the lung chapter. Okay. The pattern is not different from other forms of diffuse alveolar damage. Okay. In sepsis, for example. The reason we didn't put any figures is this. So, as, I mean, I told you that we always try to be very up to date, but we also try to be careful. Because what we are finding now, what we are seeing at that time was that some of the very early studies where electron microscopy and these were detailed, yeah. they're flawed. What they were causing, they were causing viral particles in this cell or that cell. And other people saw those experts saw this, these are not viral particles at all. These are, these are artifacts. So we, we are not at a stage where we know enough about the pathology of, of COVID-19. And so it's sort of unwise to, in a student textbook, put figures which are not based on well-established, comprehensive, you know, and proven facts, which everyone accepts. So, so uh, I chose to answer this question as an example of how we decide where we will put any figures and how we said we won't put any figures. It's not that we were shocked. There were plenty of figures available. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to add that uh, over the past uh, uh, four, uh, four or five months, uh, uh, as all of us have seen, the clinical description of uh, of uh, this particular uh, infection uh, has changed so dramatically you know there was a time uh, in the beginning when people were saying that uh, uh, corona kills by uh, myocardial infarction then it veered around to saying that corona kills by uh, uh, pneumonia severe non-treatable bronchopneumonia and uh, uh, of course now people are talking about the cytokine storm the the consequently there are uh, at, at present, some studies available on the uh, pathology of uh, uh, autopsies have been done in uh, corona cases. And uh, the results are so diverse that it would perhaps be uh, fallacious to try and say that, okay, this is the, the sort of significant change in corona disease and um, uh, we should write it in a textbook. Because I'm pretty sure that uh, over the next year or so, we will have a good uh, picture of the pathology of corona disease. You know, I mean, at the moment, what is what seems to be happening is that corona is several different diseases, because some people have predominant manifestations in the heart. Now, uh, many, many, many people are now getting the lung manifestations. There are also supposed to be other manifestations of kidney failure and so on and so forth. They still haven't been linked together. Perhaps, Vinay, in the next edition of the book, you might like to... Yeah, you know, what? one thing, we, 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 of course, we have limited ability, actually. You know, when the uh, books are pub printed, uh, the publisher never prints more than six months expected supply. Okay? So the books go through reprints. So sometimes when the time comes for reprint, we are able to carefully insert a few lines here and there without messing up the page numbers and so on and so forth. Okay. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, young children are dying of a disease which resembles Kawasaki disease, which is which, which injures the heart. There are people who have developed gangrene of the toes. People have developed strokes. Yeah. So, 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 so it is too early to know how exactly the, this, this virus causes disease. And as with genetic diseases, okay, it may turn out that COVID-19 is one umbrella name, but there are four or five different subsets of it. And some patients get more of this, some patients get more of that. And we'll have to understand who is at risk for getting gangrene of the toes, who is at risk of getting pneumonia, who is the risk of getting a heart disease, who is the risk of getting stroke. We just don't know enough what it is. So therefore, uh, 
therefore we will not we will not go on that pathway until we feel that we have definite solution wo camera lena hai kya lena ho to le okay we we can we can you know take a few questions that have come from the audience okay yes okay. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. sir so, uh, thank you very much for answering all the questions that we have received in advance though we have overshot our time limit by a few minutes but it is only appropriate to answer some of the questions that we have received live and some of these questions are consistent with the questions that you have already asked uh, regarding how can uh, this book be consumed considering that this is so huge i believe that all of these questions are already answered there are some very interesting questions that uh, i will now put forward uh, the first one is in uh, the south asian edition do we get the epidemiological data related to asian population especially data on india the answer is a big yes and and uh, so so in some cases for example for example you know the incidence of breast cancer and age group at which breast cancer occurs is different in the us and different in india okay so so there may be we have paid particular emphasis on difference in incidence and epidemiology and in fact to the extent possible we have actually gone to south asia and in some cases included southeast asia okay you know thailand and Mal malaysia and so on so forth although the focus is on the indian subcontinent pakistan india sri lanka nepal bhutan and so on so forth the answer to that question is a good question and uh, uh, that is one of the things that we paid a lot of attention to and you will you will find all of that so the next question uh, here is uh, for each cancer can incidence of each cancer be given separately in the indian scenario especially in south asian edition so a lot of these questions are pertaining to south asian edition and a lot of people have asked us when this uh, south asian edition will be available in the market as well so these well, are the kind of questions which are in undated Uh, yes well uh, as as of what i found out just a few hours ago okay and the book is ready to go to the printer and i'm told that in mid july the print book should be available in india mid july late july uh then there is a question now uh, where people uh, want to inquire if there is any update on gene editing yes absolutely i i i in in the very first slide i showed you Uh, the gene editing it was called the you know crispr technology the gene editing yes absolutely there is there is not just an update there is actually a whole section written on uh, now there is one question where uh, students probably want to understand how can this uh, book can be consumed for the second year students uh, specifically to correlate pathology and medicine in the second year To, so sorry, say, say that. Say the question. To correlate with what? How can this book be used to clinically correlate pathology and medicine in the second year itself? Well, I think that uh, I mean, if you see the book, you you will notice that uh, we have a fairly large section after each disease called clinical correlations, okay, or clinical features. Sometimes we say correlations, sometimes we say features. and that attempts to which is what i told you the philosophy of the whole book is this to attempt to correlate the me disease mechanism with the cause the disease mechanism and its effect on the patient on 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 patient so for example when we discuss inflammation we we discuss patients have fever what causes fever okay what drugs affect affect fever and what drugs can be used to reduce fever but not just memorize it but just to understand why aspirin works why ibuprofen works why various other agents that are used for treatment of pain and fever and inflammation and so on why they work and yes it, it, it can, there is a very very good correlation that we have made sure uh, and sometimes we have clinical pictures actually you know for example we have a clinical picture of a of a of a of a woman who has scleroderma systemic sclerosis and the claw like sort of fingers okay we have a figure of a, a woman with much greatly enlarged thyroid who has graves disease okay we show the eyes of a patient with graves disease so on clinical pictures okay and this is what made robin's book in fact i can tell you something 
when the first edition of the book, which is well before uh, I was there, uh, was was sent for review to other pathologists, it came back with terrible reviews because the, the reviewer said the book doesn't contain enough morphology, but it contains more clinical features. And when Robbins read that, he told me, he said, later on when I was there, he said he was so happy to see that because that's exactly what he wanted to do to make it a clinically oriented book. Uh, so I will just ask one last question before we close today's sec uh, session, sir. Uh, uh, this question is um, uh, uh, from Shankar Sundaram and it is, uh, they are asking what is the major difference between the Southeast Asian edition and international edition and which should be followed for us as pathology residents? Okay, well, Manoj, you can answer that question. <laughs> um, in the South Asian edition, actually, as I told you, we have uh, added a section of um, uh, things which we felt were uh, either not there or they were not adequately discussed in the main book. Uh, these uh, uh, are important for an undergraduate student as well as postgraduate students in this part of the world. Because uh, postgraduates actually are going to uh, be reading uh, much more detailed books and textbooks in their own speciality, whether they are in pathology, medicine, surgery, or whatever. But understanding basic pathophysiology, you would need a grounding here. And the Robbins textbook would be a, a, a good medium for giving you that grounding whatever topic you are reading and that precisely is the point which we are trying to sort of uh, increase and improve the 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 pathophysiology and the 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 differences in uh, other parts of the world so actually what we have uh, uh, at the moment are you know a mixture of various uh, uh, various things uh, epidemiology uh, different epidemiologies are there uh, uh, different mechanisms are there, you know, some, uh, it's more of a khichdi because this is supposed to be a book which is going to sort of become the basis for a holistic knowledge of pathophysiology of disease, not only <coughs> specific issues or uh, 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 so on. And I hope that this trend, uh, trend will continue. In, um, in future volumes of the book so that understandings are improved. So, so you know, to answer a very specific, uh, because I think the question was asked by a resident that how can residents sort of benefit from it, for example. So, for example, uh, in the uh, section, there's, there's additional material in the South Asia edition in which the frequency of various translocations in acute myeloid leukemia are presented. And the frequency of the, 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 the mutation, the, 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 the translocations and cytogenetic changes are not very different from they are what they are in the, in the rest of the world. But the frequency is different, okay? So for example, in the frequency of EGFR expand, you know, amplification is different in patients who are have lung cancer in India and lung cancer in the US or those who have breast cancer in India versus good cancer. So, so these are not for undergraduates. These are written because we knew that a certain proportion of uh, postgraduates will also use this book. This is not a substitute for a book on breast pathology okay, or bone pathology. The postgraduate students will have to read those. But in terms of getting a general overall idea of the differences between incidences and, and to some extent expression of disease, uh, it will be useful for them. At least we have tried to make it useful for them and we'll hear from you and you'll tell us how useful it is. All right, so, so uh, I mean, as we speak, we are inundated with so many questions. Some of these are suggestions, some of these are very 
topical specific content related questions where people are inquiring regarding what is covered uh, what is covered in detail what are the topicals that are there in the book maybe what we can do we will share the complete list of question and answers that we have received uh, during this live session and we will share it across uh, to both of you and maybe then we will gather the answers and send the answers back to uh, the inquirers um yeah. with uh, this uh, i would like to thank both of you once again i would like to thank all the attendees who have joined us this morning to learn about the subject and uh, the book itself a few pa parting notes from you sir well uh, you know as i said at the very beginning that uh, authors exist because students exist so you are the reason for our existence you are the reason why starting in 1979 i spent more than 40 years writing these books because because you tell me it gives you value and it since it gives me value i keep on working on it most of you probably don't know how old i am okay but i i won't <laughs> i won't tell you because otherwise manoj is going to feel upset ye mera bada bhai hai lagta nahi hai aise uh so so uh, we are thankful to the elsevier staff for arranging this thing but we are equally thankful to all the attendees who have asked questions i can tell you on an average i receive two to three questions per day I, these days you know hamara this is a joke we made okay and it's uh, sort of a, 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 in a in a parting way okay so so uh during certain months we start getting questions from yemen okay most of us can't even put place the yemen on the map of the world to yemen kaha pe okay and so these questions sir dear sir i am in the sana school of medicine in yemen and i have the following questions so so when these start questions start coming we we forward them to our co-editors and i usually write a note the yemen branch of our office is open now okay because we know we know when they are learning what part of pathology in yemen because that's when we start getting questions so the yemen the yemen yemen branch has just opened a week ago and today i have received three questions from yemen okay so we answer every single question that is sent to us okay we never ignore any question even if we don't have a full answer for it we will always respond because we respond because you have taken the trouble of writing to us and we owe you to at least you know give you some sort of an answer for that so thank you very much and you don't have to go through the elsevier route my email address is known to everybody you can write to me directly as many people do thank you very much sir thank thank you dr saying thank you dr kumar i think this was very insightful and we have learned um, a lot from today's session with this i would like to end um, the, this talk to author session just posted in the series i would like to inform all of our attendees today that we will keep coming back to you with a lot more such interesting sessions in the future so please stay tuned to our facebook page uh, to get information on upcoming sessions with this a very good morning and goodbye have a pleasant day all of you